Welcome. My name is Allison Garland. I'm uh, here from Washington, D.C., from the Wilson Center, where I work in the Urban Sustainability Lab. Welcome to our session on cities welcoming diversity and managing migratory flows. Migration is at the top of the political agenda in countries and cities around the world, and public attention is focused on how to cope with the influx of newcomers, particularly in urban areas where most migrants and refugees are settling. The effects of migration are most felt at the local level. Services such as housing, healthcare, education, and skills training are being provided by cities. This panel will explore how urban areas are facing the challenges of accommodating immigrants and embracing diversity and inclusion. We'll examine migration policies and practices that are shaping cities around the world today, looking at some of the barriers to integration and some of the civic tools that mitigate marginalization and exclusion. It's an honor for me to uh, moderate this panel, and I'd like to introduce the speakers in order. Um, first, we have Mr. Killian Kleinschmidt. He's the founder and CEO of the Startup Innovation and Planning Agency in Vienna. We have Mr. Ramon Sanjuja Velez, the Director of Migrants Attention and Hosting at the Barcelona City Council. Dr. Dionysia Lambiri, Project Coordinator of the Athens Coordination Center for Migrant and Refugee Issues from the City of Athens. And Ms. Eunice Rendon of the Instituto Tecnologico de Estudios Superiores de Monterrey, Mexico. So we'll get started right away. Yep. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, well, I have been um, setting up a startup looking into ways of how to deal with issues of migration and refuge. But I've also been out there in the, in the world um, doing refugee work with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees for 25 years, setting up refugee camps, providing aid, running operations in the deep field. And, well, I made a decision that we get something wrong. And that's why I changed my life and I'm now devoted to move the narrative into another direction. And I think it is absolutely necessary now that we have finally, finally in our world, in this developed world, discovered that there is something like refuge. There are people on the move. And somehow the two million or so people who came over the last few years in the direction of Europe have helped us to actually get this topic on the agenda. So in a way, they are my heroes, because it was very little debated before what this is all about, people on the move. I'm here to plead for a change of the, of the paradigm, for a change to how do we look at displacement, forced displacement, but simply desperate migration at large because of many factors, push factors as we know, and pull factors, push factors being obviously war and persecution, obviously increasingly climate change and uh, changing conditions, poverty, exploitation, no access to basic human rights make people move. And that actually must bring us to rethink the way of how we deal with displacement. Um, first of all, the numbers we have been talking about um, always get stuck with the 22.5 million refugees. UNHCR counts, 45 million displaced people. No, sorry, there are a billion people or so on the move, and we must count those who are actually getting into the urban centers, who are getting away from the absence of any opportunities and perspectives, and get into into what they hope will be providing them with new um, hopes and chances. So it's a billion people in all together, roughly, uh, we can uh, count in the world, and it's not only the 22.5 million. Historically, and I think this is also very important to remember that, historically, I mean, we are born out of migration. We are born out of people moving on. Cities have always been sanctuaries. Urban centers have been in fact, providing protection and hope for a lot of people historically. I was recently lecturing in, uh, in Venice, uh, where we can say Venice is one of the most beautiful refugee cities ever created. People 
building that wonderful place out of nothing because they were escaping from the Huns and the barbarians, people like, like me coming from, from Germany. Um, and uh, today, uh, this is, in fact, recognized that people will never go back. So there comes a point which is actually preventing us from freeing our minds. And this is, I think, very important when we get into planning and the way of how we look at it. In our minds since the Second World War, since we created the Refugee Convention, since we created the storytelling of a good refugee is returning home, and that is actually his best solution, we're preventing ourselves from taking the right measures. We are born out of that movement. Yes, a lot of this very negative movement, very few of our ancestors have ever returned. So that means also taking this as a fact that there are demographic changes, and we have to accompany them. And here, so the, the plea goes in the direction to look into these movements which lead to the setup of temporary refugee camps which last for 50, 60, 80, 100 years and transform only then gradually once the resources, humanitarian resources, dry up into more permanent settlements. What we're seeing, for instance, currently happening in Bangladesh is an example of a serious human rights violation, violence, and aggression by a state against part of its people being the Rohingya in uh, the neighboring Myanmar. They're coming. We can think there will be up to a million people also coming into Bangladesh. And they're being housed in refugee camps. For how long will there be in these camps? With humanitarian resources, which will be drying up after decades, so here, we need to look into it from a totally different perspective. And that's where we come now to a way forward as well, looking at these numbers which seem to be so shocking of people on the move, uh, be it Africa, be it now such movements uh, we're seeing in, in Asia and, and elsewhere, moving f towards recognizing that this is, in fact, taking place, that we need to also look into coming back to the Bangladesh example, into the fact that millions of Bangladeshi citizens have to move away from coastal regions, have to move in a direction, um, uh, will be moving and have been moving in the direction of urban centers. So what if we begin to be more aggressive and looking at um, the creation of new population centers, of actually equipping um, the nucleus of existing uh, population centers better to deal with millions of people who will not go back. It's an illusion. We have to accept that displacement will be not temporary, but will be final. So that means really building up, let's say in Bangladesh, new population centers for 20, maybe 30 million, maybe 40 million people. So what? Investing in new centers is possible. Capital is plentiful in the world. Investors are looking for new opportunities. So instead of seeing displacement and forced displacement and refuge as a burden, we must see it as a start, as a new start, to get there where everybody should be. The world has invented a lot. The world has tremendous resources, technology, know-how. Uh, you just need to look out here when we go into this hall and we see incredible technologies, incredible know-how, but it belongs only to not even half of the, the world's population. So why don't we now, I mean, in a more robust and aggressive way, begin to invest in places where that knowledge, that technology, that incredible know-how should be available as well? Again, capital investment is seeking new places. If Saudi Arabia is announcing the creation of a 500 billion worth new city at the, at the Red Sea, why is it not possible to create similar uh, structures in and around um, the various areas of Africa, hard hit by ma major population changes? Let's move into forms of governance such as special development zones linked with economic and social development. So that is, in fact, to give sort of the scene setting. And I would like to now hand over to my colleagues who will be sort of getting down into more the concrete examples of how cities, how, how regions are coping and dealing with 
the situation of displacement. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And now we will hear from uh, Mr. Ramon Sanhuja. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much for having the opportunity to share with you the situation and our policies in the city of Barcelona. I guess I'm the local guy at the panel, so I, but I understand that most people in the audience is not from Barcelona, so I should give some shots in what, what's our city. But before, I think it's very smart to link the idea of immigration and cities. It's, in fact, uh, cities wouldn't be anything without immigration. Can you imagine New York, London, Paris, these cities in the history without immigration? It's impossible, it's linked, it's, they go together. Uh, but the question here is, when we talk about immigration, uh, who's administ whose competence is immigration? Okay, who's, who's responsible for, when we talk immigration, who, is, the, is it the state? Is it the region? Is it the European Union? Is it the local administration? Well, it depends. It depends on what we're talking. Usually, most uh, discussions is about migration flows, and the competent is usually the states. But there's another side. There's the human side of immigration. People who move and establish in concrete places, and these people need uh, places to live, places to work, uh, schools, health, etc., and the daily living. And this is something that happens at the local level, as Alison said at the beginning. So the integration process, the intercultural process, is something that is the local level which is competent. And there's no laws about it. It's the reality. It's a social process. Okay? Barcelona. Barcelona, as you see, is a city of 1.6 million of inhabitants, 4 million uh, in the metropolitan area, very high dense city. We have a foreign population about 17.8%, but 22.5% are born abroad. And we are an aging population, 22% uh, plus 65. And uh, we are, as many cities are in historically a city of immigration, but we are a recent international immigration city. Um, for example, these are the first nationalities in our, in our city. The first one is Italy, it's sur surprising. Okay, the second China, Pakistan, France, Morocco. But if you compare it with, with the place of birth of our residents, there's a big difference here. Ecuador, Peru, Argentina, there's many Latin American nationals who have been naturalized, who have been now access to the national uh, nationality, to the Spanish nationality. For example, we have 29,000 Italians, but only 16,000 have been born in Italy. Many of them have born in other countries. So this is only to give you some uh, short, short, a quick shot on the city. As you can see, we experienced a big immigration flow during 2001 and 2009 when the economy was busting. The main pooling factor for immigrants to come to our city is jobs. Is, are there jobs? Yes. So people is coming. It's, this is uh, natural. When the crisis started, as you can see, the, the inflow stopped. Okay. Uh, Nevertheless, nevertheless, as you may know, Spain and Barcelona uh, really uh, started a big crisis since 2007 to 2008. Unemployment rise from 7% to 20%, just like this, quickly. Youth unemployment went up to, up to 50%. Migrant unemployment, still 36%. There was big budget cuts, austerity policies. That means less hospitals, less doctors, less schools, less teachers. Social benefits were cut down. And uh, that was the, the context of the crisis. And there's also the banking crisis, which uh, 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 resulted in a, in a very big number of evictions. One of our neighborhoods in Barcelona is known as the eviction village because it's the place in Europe with more evictions. So also there was an increase of number of vulnerable persons like migrants in irregular status. This is a picture of this eviction village. It's not the city center of Barcelona that you may visit maybe one of these days. It's, it's in the outskirts. It was built in the 60s. Uh, it's a urban uh, 
uh, is not connected with the rest of the urban tissue of the city and with big buildings, etc. It's like more like it looks like a banlieue in, 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 in France, okay? And the evolution of the unemployment went like this in the, our city. It really increased from 7% to 20%. So, which is the classic hypothesis in this situation? You have massive immigration previously, deep economical crisis in a dense complex area, austerity policies, corruption cases, cases have had a lot of corruption in Spain, okay? Austerity policies, so is the perfect cocktail for riots, ethnic tensions, racism, xenophobia. I was the responsible of immigration and all the experts tell me, Ramon, get ready, this is going to be hell. We are going, we are going to have a lot of problems with these uh, ethnic tensions, but let's see what happened. If we compare the evolution of unemployment and the evolution of the perception of migration as the main problem of the city of Barcelona, we see that the perception really went down. So migrants, migrants were not the scapegoats of the situation, like in other places in Europe. Uh, there was big social distress, there was conflicts related, but no xenophobic parties, no xenophobic reaction. So why, how, how, how is it this possible? How, how, how do you explain this? No? Well, there's some uh, possibilities of explanation. First, the Spanish legal framework, which is, has some interesting things from the legal framework from the state, like the local register for all migrants, including irregular migrants. We have some legal procedures that facilitate uh, to get access to, to regularity. We, the Spanish public debate in the political issues, we're, we're not, it's not about immigration. We're distracted with other issues, like Catalan uh, independence, for example, and we're not discussing so much about uh, these other issues of immigration, like other countries in Europe. Also, the, the recent memories of a, of a past of fascism, which it's very easy to someone who speaks on a xenophobic way to link it to this past. And people said, no, no, I don't, we, I don't want to be related to the fascist past. Local political reasons. We have a very extraordinary leadership by uh, our mayor, not by the, or our mayor now also, but also the other mayors. All the mayors had really commitment on the leadership of the immigration. We had political consensus with all many political parties agreed on the main policies with unanimity almost. We have continuity in the policies above all. Also another factor is the, our civic society. The engagement of the civic society has been incredible. We have many networks. Uh, NGOs, they do a tremendous job and they can collaborate with the local administration in order to produce better and more efficient policies and to arrive where the city cannot arrive. For example, one of these is one of the pictures of the massive demonstration on, uh, for welcome refugees. Uh, that was one of the biggest that we had in the, in the city of, in Europe. Finally, the migration policies that we have done, I think I would like to think that they have contributed to, to these good results. Uh, we had welcome policies for migrants since arrival. Uh, do not hesitate to, pr to uh, include all migrants, including irregular migrants, to have access to mainstream uh, services like health, education, from moment zero. The irregular today is the future regular. Don't wait. Just produce uh, and do uh, policies as, much, as soon as possible. Uh, mediation, proximity projects, projects anti-rumor strategy to influence the, the bad perception of some people regarding to migrants. And finally, our, our uh, framework. Our framework is what we call the intercultural approach, which goes beyond the assimilation model and the uh, multicultural approach, which is based in three principles, the principle of equality, the principle of respect of diversity, and which is especially, specifically from the principle of interculturality is the interaction. We like to that people uh, uh, have what in Spanish is a word that in English has no translation, which is convivencia, okay? Which is not coexistent. It goes beyond coexistent. It, uh, uh, convivencia means also conflict sometimes. Yes, we don't have to hide co conflicts. We have to face conflicts and solve conflicts. So I uh, would finish here. Uh, we want to build a common sense of belonging from all residents in the city with this political leadership, 
uh, give opportunities to migrants, to feel, feel them that they are part of the city in the public space, to have uh, an opportunity and a, a face in, in the future in our, in, our, in our city. So we think, we think diversity, diversity is a smart asset for our city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, next, we will hear from Dr. Dionysia Lambiri. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Dionysia Lambiri. I work on a project called uh, Migrants and Refugees um, uh, coordina Observatory Coordination for the City of Athens. And today, what I would like to do is um, present to you uh, the project we're working on in the City of Athens and some other initiatives that uh, the City of Athens has proactively undertaken in the recent years after the refugee crisis, which started mainly in 2015 onwards. Uh, and present also some challenges um, for the municipality of Athens, uh, mainly related to in the integration of this uh, newly arrived population in, in the city. Athens, as most of you know, has been under um, immense pres pressure in recent years. Um, I just show you some, uh, some data from UNHCR. These are quite recent. These are from, uh, from January this year till a couple of days ago, November 2017. Uh, of course, the flows since 2015 have been uh, much slower, but you can st st see that uh, arrivals continue uh, in Greece. There are many people stranded in the Greek islands. And um, these people will eventually move to the mainland after their asylum pr procedures have been cleared and most of them will, uh, will arrive in the city of Athens. So, as I said before, since 2015, Athens has, in, has seen an unprecedented uh, situation uh, due to the arrival of, uh, of many refugees um, that has been new not only for, uh, for Greece, but for Europe as a whole. Athens became the biggest European city of transit and uh, has seen an, an immense influx of uh, refugees. And as you can understand, the city of Athens has been under extreme pressure to, come, to be proactive and uh, come up with solutions for, this, uh, for the refugee influx, practical solutions. Today, however, in November 2017, things are different from what we experienced in 2015. And they are more complex because now we are not only dealing with issues of uh, temporary accommodation as it was in 2015, in March, when people have been uh, you know, arriving uh, with the boats in, in the mainland, in Athens, in the port of Piraeus. We are dealing with a more complex issue, which is linked, of course, with integration of this, the integration of this, uh, of this people. So we have both the accommodation of these people and the integration of these people who are going to to stay in, in Greece. Here you can see how the situation is changing. Uh, just, just to, we have been told by the organizers to use pictures, and here they are. Um, you can see the situation back in 2015 where people have been arriving with boats, live, staying, um, not having places to stay, live, staying in main squares in Athens. And then the next, the picture on your right hand side, the situation that we are working on towards now. Uh, refugee children uh, going to schools together with, uh, with Greek uh, children, with Athenians. So what is the need? Um, the first thing that we need to, we had to work, the city of Athens has had to work with is that to understand that, yes, the, the number of the people that are going to stay in, uh, in Greece and especially in Athens is uncertain, but people will stay in Athens even if in the majority of them uh, do not want to stay in Greece because Greece is a transit country. We have data to prove that. And what we need to do, um, what the city of Athens needs to do as a local authority is to understand this constantly changing situation of the refugee and migrant flows and to understand, understand the needs and the possibilities of the integration and inclusion of this, uh, of this population. So what are the two things that need to be in place in order to do that? The first thing is to have a systematic recording, to have um, scientifically based information of, of, on, on 
the nature of this population, because when we are talking about refugee population, we are not talking about one nationality, we're not talking about age group, one age group. We're talking about a very diverse uh, population. And the second thing that is, uh, is new in, uh, in Athens, and it's, uh, it's the challenge, is also to start to, to think in terms of synergies, to start to, uh, to develop collaboration between the local authority and the civil society, like Ramon said before, that has worked very well in Bar for Barcelona as well. And importantly, to build capacity for the city of Athens, for the personnel of the city of Athens, to be able to deal with uh, issues of integration. And this is the, the thing that the city of Athens has, is a, is a challenge for the city of Athens, and it's something we need to work on uh, systematically. So, a few words about the project we are currently working on, which started um, in, uh, in February 2016. Um, sorry, 2017. Uh, it's a very new project. It, it was launched actually uh, in June 2017, so it's extremely new. It's the MRCCNO project, My Migrants and Refugees uh, Coordination Center and Observatory project. This is a partnership, a private public partnership between the city of Athens and the Stavros Nyarhos Foundation, so the whole project has been fund privately funded. And the challenge of the project is basically to, for the city of Athens, even, even though it is not uh, within the domain of the city of Athens to work uh, on issues uh, of integration, it is, it's at the national level. Integration is a national government responsibility, not a local government responsibility. Um, to start uh, working uh, towards um, policies for integrating this uh, the population, refugee population in, in Athens in a strategic way. So the project has really um, five axes. One is, uh, is, uh, is linked with um, research. So this is the Athens Observatory for Refugees and Immigrants. It's a, it's a survey that has been conducted in the city of Athens between uh, um, both for refugee population and for Athenians. Uh, looking at the demographics of the refugee population, looking at the views of Athenians uh, about uh, whether they think, what they think about coexisting with the refugee population in Athens. I'm not going to talk about this uh, much because it's, uh, it would take me much more than 10 minutes that I have. The second axe is the, the Athens Coordination Center. It's the mechanism we are developing, um, coordination mechanism between the city of Athens and international and local NGOs working in Athens at the moment. Um, the third aspect is the digital coordination platform. It's an online tool we are building for coordination pur purposes in the city of Athens. And the other two outputs is a strategic action plan for integration that we are developing and a preparedness mechanism which will prepare Athens for future refugee uh, crisis. Um, I see that I don't have much time, so I will go quite fast. Um, so the, the coordination center, what we are doing is uh, we have sent invitations to all organizations that are working in Athens, international organizations and local NGOs, uh, to participate in a mechanism um, by working in, in groups, in committees, uh, and develop uh, strategic plans for the city of Athens. So at the moment we have 68 member organizations, or over 200, well, over 190 people working in the city of Athens in international organizations, local NGOs, and municipal departments. Their work is organized um, in five working committees, uh, one focusing on uh, legal rights and access to, to human, um, ac access to, to rights. One is um, focusing on uh, issues of employment amongst refugees. One is working on issues of housing and peaceful coexistence between refugees population and Athenians. The other one is focusing on issues of education, and the other is working on issues of, uh, of health and well-being uh, of uh, the refugee population. The, the second thing we have developed is digital platform. Um, this is under development, will be ready in a couple of months. Uh, it's a platform that shows um, to all organizations and to the civil society, to all population in Greece, what kind of, kind of services are available by district in the city of Athens. Um, and this offers, first of all, a, a mapping of existing services, but also a, a way to identify a possible gaps in the provision of, uh, of services. The 
two key outcomes of these coordination mechanisms is a, a strategic action plan for integration, which is a, it is a, a plan um, uh, for which um, all organizations have given input. So it's not something that we impose as a city of Athens to, to organizations. All organizations have the opportunity to provide input to the city of Athens to develop the strategic action plan. And the other thing we have developed is um, we are currently developing with uh, experts from uh, big international organizations is a preparedness mechanism, a contingency plan, um, so that Athens can be prepared uh, in the case of a future refugee crisis. Other initiatives that the municipality of Athens uh, is developing is uh, participating in uh, actively participating in uh, European other European uh, networks like uh, Eurocities together with the city of Barcelona um, um, networks against uh, racism. Uh, we are developing migrant integration centres. Uh, we are working together with uh, other organisations like um, international organisations like CARE um, or DRC to provide um, fiscal and social security documentation and legal aid to, to uh, refugees. Um, and many other projects that are related either to the accommodation and service provision uh, to migrants or to education issues um, or to family um, and child uh, uh, support uh, services. Always in, in collaboration with international organizations and local uh, NGOs. So to wrap up, what I think we have achieved so far is, first of all, build the foundations for a, for a viable structure within the municipality of Athens that um, enhances, highlights the need and the value of coordination and collaboration between the municipality and um, the civil society. And also, for in the context of Greece, um, we have managed for Athens to become like a sort of best practice uh, in this context uh, for other municipalities. The challenges, of course, are to kind of uh, make everybody understand that integration is not a political issue. It is a need for the city of Athens and for all cities. Um, and also to train and to, to build capacity within the municipality of Athens so that um, the various departments that have, have to work with uh, the migrant and refugee population are prepared um, in order to, to engage uh, and incorporate these people in the everyday life uh, of Athens. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and now we'll hear from uh, Ms. Eunice Rendon. Thank you very much. So we have already heard a lot about migration and, and the difficulties and challenges that cities that uh, receive migrants and host migrants and also all, all other problems, especially in Europe and in, the, in, in, in this region. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about other region, which is Latin America, especially the relation between Mexico and the United States, and especially now, with, uh, with all the migration policies that we are having today with uh, President Trump, and which are the, the new challenges for Mexico and also for Central America uh, and, and the United States. In global numbers, we know that migration is a world reality today, and we have challenges and opportunities from this uh, phenomenon. So we are going to talk a little bit about both. Uh, we know that there are two 224 million international migrants and 763 million internal migrants also worldwide. Also, we know that 58% of international migrants stay in developed countries with 85 million originating from a developing nation. 20% uh, of the world foreign born population is estimated to live in global cities. And also, migrants contribute to 9.4% of global gross domestic product. So they, they, they have an important contribution in economic issues. And also, more than 60% of global, global migration consists of, of people moving 
uh, to neighbor, neighboring countries or countries in the same part of the world. So th those are some of the global conditions. We also heard here some of the causes, push factors and pull factors. Uh, I, I just want to, to, to put some others in, uh, in these discussions. So in, in some of the push factors, especially in our region, uh, related with migration are unemployment, are rural poverty, for example, on sustainable livelihood, and also in terms of social political issues, we have political instability. Uh, we have also reasons of safety and security, uh, conflicts and threats, also inadequate and limited services, uh, among other infrastructure problems. And in terms of, of economic uh, issues, we, we have also other, other problems. And in terms of ecological issues, climate change and, and other crop failure uh, and, and, and other reasons. In terms of pull factors, we have also job opportunities, world, world uh, projects, industrial innovation, specialized in education, and, and also in terms of social political reasons for pull factors are family reunification and also freedom sometimes, integration and social cohesion, and also food security and affordable and accessible urban services. So those are some of, 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 of the global issues and also the positive things of, migra of migration in this, in this area are like cheap and surplus labor, close gaps in skills and also multi-ethic society. We have also here the example of Barcelona and I think it's something very similar, multicultural perspective, uh, especially in the relation between the United States and Mexico. We see the, the we can see this, um, the, 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 this integration in terms of culture because we have 35 million people from Mexican origins living now in the States. So, uh, and also we know that the United States are a multicultural country, so immigration has, has a very positive effect in, 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 in economy and in other, in, in, in other sectors. Uh, for example, only talking about Mexican population, we have the 8% of the gross product, uh, internal product of the States are, are, are given by the Mexican migrants and, and many other impacts, as I already told you, in terms of cultural, economic, and, and, and social, uh, so, social issues. Uh, we, we, we have also some of the negative perspective that are already said here, uh, like on the employment of local people or, or the fear that we have of, of migrants, and, and in the, especially now in the states of, of Mexican migrants. Uh, but what, what I, I want to underline also is something that is happening in, in countries like Mexico. For example, we are a country that have all the phenomena of mi migration. That means we are an expulsion co country, but we are also a transit country and also a reception. And now, uh, 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 also the, a return country uh, uh, of migrants. That means that since 2007, or also with Obama, not only with Trump, we had a lot of people coming back to Mexico. We have like, um, uh, we have 250,000 Mexicans coming back each year f since 2007. So now another challenge, we have all the challenges for, for receiving migrants and, and having all the policies that here were, were underlined, like uh, this, these reception policies, but also reintegration, readaptation policies uh, with a multicultural perspective. But also now one of our main challenges is the reintegration of people that were in the States for a long time. Uh, we heard uh, from Trump that uh, they, they are giving us back all the criminal, criminals, but uh, the, real, the real numbers are that only the 6% of the people that are coming back in deportation to Mexico are, are, have a criminal background. All the others, which are, are, are a lot, are, are just like administration crimes or some, some little, little uh, faults. And also, uh, what we have today, and it's something that is going to, 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 to be even worse next year, is like a lot of people that were trying to cross from Mexico to the United States, which are, which are people from Central America, now they are staying in Mexico because of the fear they have from Trump, because they 
cannot get into the states. So that gave us also other challenges in terms of reintegration and reinsertion policies that we have to take uh, uh, in, we, we have to take it very seriously in order to, uh, to put and to develop the policies we need in terms of identity, for example, we, we need uh, to, to have, and, and not all, only Mexico, I think that, uh, that host countries need to enhance um, immigrants' capacity uh, uh, as, 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 as development actors uh, and create sense of belonging between belong them between them in, in sense to 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 being part of the community and we also have to see them as act uh, not only at the at the main object of public policies but also as as the main actors in these policies in order to integrate them in different ways also in economical cultural uh, education policies for example i i i want uh, to, to, to put uh, on the table some of the problems we have with reintegration people uh, and policies that are in terms of identity, some of the migrants that are coming back, they don't have any identity, they don't have any, any paper that prove there are uh, Mexicans, so this is a problem when they are come back. Also in terms of education, we don't have like, uh, the, 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 the education they have followed, for example, little children in the States are not the same uh, system as Mexico, so we have problems in order to certificate their education. Also in, term, or in terms of, of labor and employment, a lot of migrants that have developed some abilities in the States or, or abroad, they, they don't have a certificate of that. So in terms of employment, it's, they have some difficulties in, in order to be reintegrated. And, and also we have a, lo a lot of other uh, issues that are, that are now a problem. And uh, also with, uh, with the present admi administration of the United States, we have seen some shanks, for example, in terms of xenophobic reactions in the States. Uh, it's not only the language uh, that, that the president is using, but also that we have seen uh, an increase of 20% 20 20 of hate crimes, for example, in the States. So all that, those issues, also we have an increase of 30% of the te detentions of people, of, of migrants in the States, and also 30% of increase in detention in, with people without any crime background, only for, for being, being migrants there, they, 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 they have been uh, uh, caught by the, by the, by the police. Uh, and also, we have also a new profile of deportation. That means it's not these people that I already told you, the criminals, the criminals ones, it's a lot of people. And now we have, a, 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 with Obama and, and we, with other presidents, that deportation used to be, 80% of deportation were the people that were trying to get into the states and they were deported in that, in, 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 in that moment. And now we have uh, a lot more of deported people that have been in the states for more than 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. So that that means very, very different challenges in terms of people that are coming back because they have their families and they have their everything they have in the States. So we need to, to see a new perspective on, 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 on that issue. And also, as I already told you, we have now uh, different populations from other countries, even from IT. We have now more than 5,000 people of IT in, in the northern part of Mexico. And now they don't want to go to the state because they, they already saw that it's very difficult. And with all the policies, it's even more difficult. So they ask Mexico also the, the, the permission to stay. So, so we are going to see a lot of new factors in terms of asylum and refugees, also new policies from the United States uh, established that if one person wants to ask a, a asylum or, or refugee in the States, they have to stay in Mexico in the time they decide if they can get in or not. And we also see a decrease uh, number in, in terms of this kind of visa or permissions. So, uh, so I think that in terms of migration and global issues, we, 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 we we need to know that we have new phenomena in different uh, regions of the world, and also I, uh, uh, we need a, a broader perspective for that, for reintegration, for the people that also are crossing back. We have a very special problem in Mexico and the states and Central America with minors, on, on, on uncompanied minors, who, who are uh, 60,000 of these children 
went to, to each, each year since 2014 to, to the states, from Central America to the states, and now it's also, so, uh, a lot of them, like 40,000 are also staying in Mexico. So all these issues are also part of the global, global problems of migration and also of the global opportunities, because if we, we can make like a, a projects integrating them in a productive and, and in a cultural um, a perspective, we can we, we can afford these kind of challenges, but w when we we need to adapt them to the new rules and also to the new to the new actions and also to the new phase that we have with migration policies in Latin America. Uh, and I just want to to finish with uh, I think that host countries in in all the phenomenons of migration need to facilitate migrants' contribution to cultural, civic and economic development of society through inclusive policies in order to profit of, of, of their cultural backgrounds, their, uh, their abilities, and also their capabilities. And also, I, I just to, for, for finish the, the United States and Mexico relation, also we have seen that in some of the states that we used to have like very strict policies in terms of migration, like Arizona, they, uh, when migrants get out of, of Arizona, they also had some negative impact in terms of economic development and in terms of economic uh, issues in this in this part of the state so uh, we are going to see what is going to happen but what i i, I want to say is just that we have new uh, a new phase of, of this phenomenon and we have to to, to develop policies of not only for integrate migrants that are coming to uh, Latin American countries, especially Mexico, but also to the migrants that are coming back to their own countries with a different perspective and different challenges that we have to afford. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of our speakers. I think um, one common thread is that, that every all of our speakers have underscored is that um, migration and displacement, these are not temporary issues um, that um, cities uh, must find ways of integrating um, new arrivals to the city with, and, and, that, and that these people are making these cities their homes, um, that there are different strategies, whether it's special development zones, whether it's building capacity, whether it's a culture of convivencia, um, that there are different strategies that cities can take. Um, to welcome migrants. And um, I think another interesting challenge is the tension between the fact that these policies are set at the national level, but they're impacting local level governments. Um, and I would like to hear a little bit more from the speakers about ways to work around those tensions or ways that to coordinate better um, of international policy, national policy, and then the reality on at the local level. Um, and then I think finally, um, the case of Athens and the case of Mexico, it's important to see that some of these arrival cities, which used to be transit cities, are now having to rethink um, policies because um, they're, they're becoming more permanent destinations um, and no longer um, I don't know if that's changed perspectives um, of the residents, of the, the, uh, of the migrants, and of the local government. So do you want to? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot is about resources. A lot is about the means one has to actually develop services, infrastructure, and so on. And this is, I think, all cities are struggling with that. I mean, there's one initiative um, now to I mean, besides the 100 Resilient City Initiative and, and others uh, trying to enforce and, and enhance cities' capacities to deal with that, one initiative to build up a European fund to have municipalities actually draw on. Now, what we're also discovering, and I just had a discussion on that yesterday morning, actually, in Germany, is, um, is um, I mean, we have forgotten a, a lot, and when we take the European perspective, we have forgotten a lot about social housing, we have forgotten about all these social inventions after the Second World War to, to cope with our own reconstruction. So one of the issues is, for instance, uh, in, in German municipalities don't have big apartments. It's a simple fact because families of newcomers are bigger, are larger, more members, can't find. So I mean, there is, there is, a, is, a, is a definite need to invest again into what we have forgotten. 
So that's uh, sort of the European perspective, which is again very different from, from others. And, and I think here we're talking about um, uh, giving poor, very poor municipalities, which are overwhelmed. I, I work, I think I mentioned it last year already, I work uh, closely with the city of Duhuk in northern Iraq. And we had here the uh, representative from, from Kurdistan, uh, 700,000 people more in the region. I mean, these are real challenges and no resources. So that's where we need to, to be much more innovative with blended finance, with in investing in municipalities, capacities, technology transfer. And we have that recently experienced also with Libyan municipalities, which are now very keen and eager actually to restart and getting away from the nation state level to the municipalities taking on the lead. I think that is what, what is very key here. Yeah, uh, thank you, Kilian. I would like to challenge you a little bit. I don't think it's only about uh, having capacities and resources. It's also about uh, political will. In Europe, especially, Europe is one of the richest places in the world with the highest uh, growth and, and GDP. And uh, we have resources in Europe. And when during the crisis, for example, in Greece, there were hundreds of thousands stuck up there. There was a, 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 a a commitment by the European Union for relocation and reubication, which really didn't work. Uh, very, very low figures at the end on what was expected. We, the cities, we we were pushing this. Uh, we were in favor uh, of to to be more effective in this. Uh, in so we had a, a project, a city to city project, uh, uh, from Athens, Barcelona, and Amsterdam. The idea was to pr to to overcome these uh, 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 impediments by the states. We were ready to receive people directly from Athens, and Amsterdam was ready to receive people from Athens. The mayors were ready to receive it. We agreed, we had the capacities, but the state didn't allow. Not in Spain, not in Holland. So it's, it's also about political will, and I, I'm afraid in Europe right now, uh, in most countries, uh, this, there's a big lack of this political will. <clears throat> yes, I think uh, what Kilian said before about uh, direct access to, to fund for cities is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something that I hope is going to, to be reality once uh, it, is, it is understood that cities are under immense pressure, especially as big international organizations are leaving uh, the cities due to, to funding that uh, is, uh, is being uh, shrunk or, or finishes. So this is, a big, uh, this is a big issue. It's a reality that Athens will soon face. Um, as far as the Athens Coordination Center is concerned, uh, we are doing our best to include uh, the ministries in, uh, in uh, the, the work of the Athens Coordination Center. And at the moment, we are happy to see that both the Ministry of Migration and the Ministry of Education are members, <laughs> um, are participating in the work of the Athens Coordination Center. Well, you already said everything, but I, I think that uh, also private sector, private sector and society are very important factors in terms of migration and in terms of having better policies. Uh, for example, in terms of economic innovation, private sector can be a very important actor, and also they can take uh, they can take advantage from from migrants on, and from their abilities, especially in, in some sectors, in special sectors. And also in terms of society, I think that we need also more commitment from society. Maybe uh, if they know more about migrants and and, and the, all the conditions conditions and all, all the abilities they have and all the positive things is also very important, I think, all over the world in order to, to stop xenophobic uh, behavior mm -hmm. in, in terms of migration. Okay. Um, now I'm going to read a question that we have from the audience. Um, the question is, how can new urban designs and urban policy frameworks foster diversity and, e and make easier the management of migratory flows? So. Uh, um, Maybe I know Barcelona would have some examples about yeah. urban design. And yes, uh, I think it's very important. Urban design, how you design the city can uh, uh, drive uh, segregation or, or integration, okay? If you design a city with uh, diverse uh, housing, with different social mm -hmm. classes, with uh, connection with uh, public transport, accessibility, so probably you end up having a, a mix of uh, different population 
which fosters interaction, which end up with more relations with diverse people. If you uh, have a policy of getting uh, uh, very, very specialized uh, uh, parts in the city, uh, maybe you have two zoning, for example, two, you have two, two specialized areas and there's more segregation for economic activity, residents, and even sometimes in some countries, uh, there's uh, also policies to ethnic uh, enclaves or ethnic uh, neighborhoods, which is, it is a policy, okay? In Holland, for example, I remember the city of Den Haag, they wanted to have an Indian neighborhood, okay? So they foster all Indians to go there. It's their policy. Uh, we don't follow that here in, in, in Barcelona. Uh, communities, they tend to gather together, but one thing is this natural. Uh, another thing is that the city promotes that. Our, our perspective is to, to promote this uh, interaction to s diverse mix of residents in every neighborhood and enable the people to move around and, and mix. And in the case of Mexico, um, are you seeing new forms of urban design? Or some, in some parts, like as I already told you, for example, now one of the things that had been very interesting is that all the people from IT that are in Mexico, they don't even speak Spanish, no? so they speak French or Creole. Uh, uh, so it has been a, a very important challenge in terms, not only in urban, in urban structure and mobile, mobility, mm -hmm. mobility, but also in terms of cultural issues. We don't, in Mexico, we don't have black people. So from one day to another, we have 5,000 5, people uh, from IT, and it's socially it's very it's difficult all the integration of the people because they don't are they, they don't even uh, they they are not used to and and also to people that didn't speak our language so they have built some policies in terms of mobility and, uh, because they were when they arrived they were in in one of the parts of Baja California of Tijuana but they were very far away from the city so now they are integrating them also in the city and they are also doing some policies in order to to give them jobs and to to, to be more part of the city mm -hmm. and also something very interesting and the, uh, people from IT now are putting new food in restaurants, so it's also a rich, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, they can make a richer food and, 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 and cult cultural uh, talking, speaking. Uh, and also another thing from urban planning and in terms of the, of the border in Mexico, uh, is, is security. Also, with all the policies that we now have with Trump, and if we have more stricter policies in terms of crossing the border, we are going to have more security problems. For, I, I, I'm, I'm just going to give one example. For example, in traffic, people traffic, uh, which is a very important problem in our border, uh, more security you have, more expensive it will be to cross and new actors of, organized, of crime, organized crime are coming to this new new business. Mm -hmm. So it's more dangerous to do it now. And also traffic is becoming also treat. That, that means that you have to pay a lot to cross the border, you don't have that money, but you pay a little bit and once you cross the border, you continue paying for one year or I don't know how many times. So new actors, are coming back in, this, in, in, in on that kind of, of crimes, and is, it is more dangerous. So we have to rethink also about the impact of that kind of policies in terms of both countries. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, it's a little hard to see, but I don't know if there are any questions from the audience. We have a little bit of time left. If not, we have more questions on the iPad. I'll go ahead and ask. I, I'd be curious, um, g given the other panelists' comments, the case of Athens, um, how uh, the, the comment about housing um, and, and um, the cultural um, changes in, in the, the migrants that are staying more permanently in Athens, if you, if you could talk a little bit about that. I mean, Athens is uh, very similar to Barcelona in, in that sense, that because uh, most, apart from the, the Eleonas camp, which is the only camp that is uh, within the jurisdiction of the municipality of Athens, which is the a big urban camp uh, currently hosting more or less 2,000 people. The rest of the population, uh, refugee population, uh, lives in accommodation apartments uh, in the city of Athens, mm -hmm. um, which is, uh, for me, it's a fantastic opportunity for integration, but at the same time, as you can understand, 
due to the real estate uh, structure of Athens with uh, big, uh, big blocks of flat um, where refugee families live together with, uh, with Greek families, um, it can prove challenging. And uh, for this reason, the, um, uh, the, the accommodation scheme, accommodation service scheme, it has been renamed, that is currently run by the city of Athens and, um, and uh, uh, UNHCR, it's the UNHCR accommodation apartments run by the city of Athens. Um, have, it's not just an accommodation scheme, it needs to have uh, social workers, it mm -hmm. needs to have uh, cultural mediators, mm -hmm. it needs to have a, a full, uh, you know, a, a staff that is uh, fully prepared to deal with, uh, with everyday uh, issues that are, are as a result of uh, the cohabitation between uh, very different uh, groups, population groups. But I think this is the this is also the challenge from a positive uh, from the positive side. This is the the challenge of uh, integration. Instead of having people uh, forgotten in uh, in ghettos outside mm -hmm. the city, this is the the big challenge and um, you know the beauty, let's say, of uh, of integration. Yes, yes. And in your work, I know that you would like to share some of the. Uh, well, I mean, uh, another Greek example, um, the city of Thessaloniki has a challenge because there is no affordable housing in the city as such, because everybody has moved on Airbnb and, and, and mm -hmm. so on. I mean, I, I can tell you, I was looking for an apartment. It was very difficult. Um, so, so, I mean, there is really a need also to use that as an opportunity to reinvest in vacant real estate, which in Greece, for instance, is, is one opportunity to really restart an affordable housing approach for young people revitalization of the inner city and so on. So there are lots of opportunities around that and, and, and instead of again creating and leaving people in camps and saying, well, they will move on and so on. No, it's about integration, it's about cohabitation, it's about uh, co coexistence and, and, and so on. And so I think huge opportunities and not forcibly just from a humanitarian perspective, it's really also to revitalize cities from an economic and, and social side. Mm -hmm. So it's a good place to end on the contribution that migrants are making to cities. And thank you to all the panelists for excellent um, presentations and great discussion. Thank you.